Mm -hmm. Okay. Welcome uh, to our weekly uh, TCS seminar at the Agilonian University. Today, our speaker is Ralph Koish from Siemens Mobility Switzerland. Uh, Ralph's research interests uh, are centered around graph colorings. Uh, problems and uh, well the thing is that about two or three weeks ago Ralph published an archive and manuscript claiming the solution of the one to three conjecture so uh, the conjecture was posed by uh, Karoński, Wuczak and Thomason in 2004 and it it became viral believe me I, I I remember it well because that was the these were the years I was I was doing my PhD so many people burnt hours to play with this uh, well, innocent puzzle, right? Uh, so Ralph, we are all excited to, see, to hear the news from you. Thank you for joining us today and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. So I hope we do not have any more technical problems. I hope you see the slides. Yes, it's all good, yes. So thank you for the invitation. Also, thank you for being patient with me before with the technical problems. So I want to start with the following fact on graphs that we all know. On each graph, on at least two vertices, there are always at least two nodes that have the same degree. This is by the pigeonhole principle. So if we want to go to a setting where all nodes have a different degree, one way to do this is to look at multigraphs where we can blow up the edges, or in other terms, um, we can assign weights to the edges. So let's say we assign edge weights from one to k integer weights, and then we study the weighted degrees. So the weighted degrees are just the sum of incident edge weights for each node. And in this setting, we can try to arrange edge weights so that the weighted degrees of all nodes become different. So here I put a toy example, cyclone six nodes. We see we have edge weights from one to four, and we see that all weighted degrees are different. Now we can ask how big does my K need to be so that this becomes possible? This parameter is called the graph irregularity strength. So it's for a given graph, it's the smallest K so that we find an edge weighting with weights from one to k so that all weighted degrees become different. So in general, this parameter grows with the size of the graph. Think, for example, of a long path. There it's clear that we always need to find additional edge weights so that the weighted degrees all become different. So then in 2004, Wuczak, Karunski, and Thomason asked what happens if we weaken the setting, if not all degrees should be different, but only those of neighbors. In this example here, we see now it's possible with edge weights one, two, and three. We have two nodes with weighted degrees three. We have two nodes with weighted degree five but they are not neighbors, which is now fine. <clears throat> so in other terms, what we look here, we want to see an edge weighting where the resulting weighted degrees form a vertex coloring. So what they discovered is that somehow it seems that for each craft, it seems to be possible with edge weights one, two, and three. So it's very different from the scenario before, where the parameter increased with the size of the graph. Here, it seems to be constant. Therefore, they put the conjecture for each connected graph on at least three vertices. There exists a vertex coloring edge weighting with weights from one, two, and three. So of course, these three choices, this is best optimal in general. In this example here, it's not possible to find a vertex coloring edge weighting only with one and two. Also note that this assumption is necessary that we have at least three vertices. If you have an isolated edge, then both nodes always have the same degree. <clears throat> okay, so 
let's start with the history, with results. But are you buried Dalal, McTyre, Tweed, and Thomason? They proved a general upper bound of 30. So they proved that for each non trivial graph, it's possible to find a vertex calling edge weighting with rates only from 1 to 30. So indeed, it's possible with a constant number of edge weights, no matter how big your graph is. This bound was then improved to 16, to 13, and with a big step to 5 by Kalkowski, Hronsky, and Fender. And actually, they use a very cute argument. The proof is very short. So there are more results on specific graph classes. In the original paper, it was proven that the conjecture is true for three colorable graphs. For example, for random graphs, GNP, it's known that almost surely weights one and two are sufficient. So what they use from GNP is that you have a very small chromatic number compared to the degrees in the graph. In general, it's NP complete to decide whether edge rates one and two are possible. But on the other hand, on bipartite graphs, the problem is in P. So there you have a criterion whether this is possible or not. Now, in recent years, there are two new papers by Jakub. He proved first that for regular graphs, you don't need the edge weight five. It's always possible with one to four. And actually, that the conjecture is true <clears throat> if you have a sufficiently large degree in the regular graph. Then in the subsequent paper, he verified the conjecture for all graphs where the minimum and the maximum degree are sufficiently close together. And what I really like about this paper is that it uses the Lovash local lemma because somehow I think the lemma, the local lemma really fits into the problem. Okay, so there are a bit more results and there are some variants that have been looked at during recent years. A very natural variant are total weightings. Here, um, you not only put weights on the edges, but also each vertex gets a weight. Then the weighted degree of a node is the weight you receive yourself plus the sum of all incident edge weights. And Jakob and Wozniak asked or conjectured that it should be possible for each graph to find the vertex coloring total weighting only with vertex weights and edge weights from one and two. So here you only need two edge weights, but this conjecture is still open. So there are more variants. For example, instead of defining your vertex color as the sum of incident edge weights, you can look at the color as a multiset. So if you see incident edge weights one, three, and three, this will be different than two, two, and three. Then there's a much harder variant which is called list colorings or choosability. Here, each edge has its own list of allowed edge weights. For example, one edge has five, six, seven, one edge has two, four, six. And you want to find a vertex coloring edge weighting where each edge chooses a weight from its own list. And there's a recent survey with these problems, but also with problems that go more towards algebra. Um, if you're interested in these variants, you can look to this survey from Kritschuk. Okay, so now let's go to today's topic. I want to go back to the general setting. So in last year, it turned out that the edge weight five is not possible in the general case. So as it is true for regular graphs, also for in the general case, it's possible to find 
suited to edge rating only with rates from one to four. <clears throat> and now finally, in the last months, it turned out that actually the conjecture is true. So if you have a connected graph on at least three vertices, then we only need edge rates one, two, and three. Okay, so this proof here is based on the first result. It's kind of, yeah, the main tools I think are already present in the first result. Therefore, I decided that first we look into the proof of the first result, not into the details, but just an overview. And then we see what are the additional tools that I need for this result. <clears throat> okay, so how is the proof going for the case for? We take the graph and at the start we remove a vertex. Um, we will see later why we remove this vertex. As a next step, we take a maximum cut of the remaining graph. So we take a maximum cut ST. And the idea behind this cut is that the vertices in S should get an even weighted degree and the vertices in T should get an odd weighted degree at the end. So of course, the number of nodes with an odd weighted degree needs to be even in the graph. And this is why we need this extra vertex. If my set T has an odd cardinality, then we need this node here to balance out things. Then we start by giving each edge either rate two or three. And we do this in a way so that the vertices in S already have an even weighted degree and those in T have an odd weighted degree. So then the remaining coloring conflicts are only inside S and only inside T, but not across the cut. So, so far we have edge weights two and three used. If we have one and four also available, then we are free to adjust each edge weighting by one in both directions. And this is what we'll do in the next steps. So what is our strategy to solve this remaining coloring conflict? We start with an ordering of the vertices, with an arbitrary ordering. And then we define so-called designated colors for each node one after another. And the idea behind these colorings, behind these colors is that first we define the colors so that there are no conflicts. And afterwards, we modify the edge weights so that the weighted degrees coincide with the designated colors. So how do we pick these colors? Um, if you look at the single vertex VI, we look what's its current weighted degree, CI, and how many earlier neighbors do I have on the same side of the cut? So this is DI. So for each earlier neighbor on the same side, I have to take care of that I do not produce a coloring conflict. So we choose our designated color from this set. How does this set look like? My current color is already here, but if I have earlier neighbors on the same side, maybe this color is already used. It's already blocked by a neighbor. And therefore we add some additional potential colors and we add all even numbers in the interval CI minus 2DI until CI plus 2DI. So here we have kind of a selection of colors. The size of this set is 2DI plus one. And we pick our color from this set so that it's different from all earlier neighbors in, on the same side of the cut. Because this number is DI, we see that at least one color will do the job. <clears throat> So then we picked our colors and the remaining task is that for each node VI, we have to change the weighted degree by an even value. And this even value is at most 2DI.
So now the question is, how can we do this? How can we change the, weight the, the weights on the edges such that the weight that decrease fulfill this property? And um, one way to think about this is first to look at a single node and first to assume that we only have to change the weighted degree by amount of two. So if you have this task, only look at a single node, only change this weighted degree by two, and everything else should be the same. How can we do this? <clears throat> and the idea is that we should try to find a cycle of odd length. If I have a cycle of odd length that starts and ends at my node, then I can go around the cycle. And alternately, increase, decrease, increase, decrease, increase, decrease the edge weights. What happens on the internal nodes of the cycle, the weights remain the same. But on the starting and end node, we have twice increasing or decreasing. So with this idea, we can change the weighted degree of my starting and ending node of the cycle. And now in an ideal world, we could repeat this idea until my node has the weighted degree that we want, and then we repeat the idea on every other vertex. So let's see whether this is possible or not. So this is what we have seen. We want to change the weighted degree of a node by two by going along a cycle of odd length. And this was our graph. So maybe we have some desired changes on the edge weight. Maybe here we should increase the weighted degree by four. Maybe here decrease by two. And we want to find the cycle by first using an edge inside our set and then close the cycle near the edges between the cut. So uh, the remainder of the cycle then should be inside the bipartite graph between S and T. So for this first change, maybe we can use this cycle here. We start with the edge inside T, which should decrease its edge weight. And then we close the cycle with these two edges, increase, decrease, and then we get the desired change on the weighted degree. Then let's continue with this node. We do a first change. With this cycle here, I can decrease the weighted degree by two, but I want plus four, so I need to find a second cycle. Of course, I can start again here, but now we see we run in a problem because no edges are free anymore. So the idea does not work directly, but um, maybe now you see it. We start with a plus, so we want to continue with a minus. So for the minus, maybe I could use this edge here. So we had a plus, but I can also put the minus on there, then we are back at the start. So the cycle somehow overlap. And now we want to find somehow a formulation how we can solve this problem. Um, how are we doing this? Yeah, maybe I go back. So when we look, for example, at this cycle here above, we have this internal edge inside S here, which has a plus, and we want to continue with a minus here and we want to come back with a plus. And this is how I put tokens here. So I only take the starting edge of the cycle and I put tokens how it should continue. And these tokens indicate what, the remaining, what is the remaining change that we need. So then we add a starting node and the target node here. So how can we use these two additional nodes? We insert some additional edges. For the source node, I connect it with each plus node 
with each plus token on the side S, and I connect it with each minus token on the side T. The target node, it behaves the other way around. I connect it with the minus tokens on the left side, and I connect it with the plus tokens on the right side. So it's important that we um, be a ten. So that we be careful that we do this in an asymmetric way. And finally, we throw away the edges inside S and inside T. And now we have an auxiliary network. And in this network, we will try to find a flow from S to T. So we want to find the flow of value K. And K is the number of, let's say, intended cycles. So in this example, we have three intended cycles. We see that the degree of S is three by construction. The degree of T is also three by construction. So now in this example, we would like to find a flow of value three from S to T. So here, actually, it's possible to find the flow. I made some arcs so that you see it. And now, what are we doing with this flow? We consider the edges between S and T that are used by the flow. For each arc that goes from S to T, we increase the edge weight. And for each arc that goes from T to S, we decrease the edge weight. So this is the only rule that we have. Now, because we find a flow, we know each edge here is used just because we find a flow of maximum value. But this arc goes to a plus token. So we are somewhere here. The path from the flow needs to continue to the right. So it needs to continue with a plus edge. So indeed, we do the change that we want. We also know on the internal nodes, we do not make any changes because plus and minus cancel out. And then if we end up on side S, we know we end up with minus token and the minus tokens are connected to the target node. And on the other side on T, it's completely the other way around and both sides together, they do their job. For example, we see this with this orange edge here, it connects a minus token with a minus token. So we do the job actually on both tokens on the same time. So what we see is that if we find a flow, then we find out how we can change the edge weights so that all desired changes actually happen. And maybe we can take away the additional edges, S and T, and then we see what remains. So in our example, this will be the edge changes that we have done. So of course, now I have to show you whether the flow exists or not. So I want to prove that the flow always exists. So I want to denote with big F the set of starting edges of our intended cycles. So if I go back, we would have this edge, this edge, and the one edge here in our set big F. And assume by contradiction that there is no ST flow of this value. Well, then, by the standard Max flow min cut theorem, there must exist a ST cut, so small s, small t cut, AB, this orange cut here, of size smaller than size of big F. So let's assume we have a cut of size X and X is smaller than the size of F. Well, some of my edges inside F may cross the cut here. Let's denote them by F star. But maybe there are some that are not crossing 
the cut. Some edges here, but the important thing is that for such an edge, I have one of the two, at least one of the two auxiliary edges is also crossing the cut. So for each edge, small f that is not in f star, either it's s arc or it's t arc is in the cut AB. Let's look at yet another set of edges, E star. E star is the set of edges that are contained in both cuts, in the cut ST, but also in the cut AB. <clears throat> so how big is this set? Well, it's of, of course, it's at most X. But we have to subtract one edge for each small f that is not in f star. Because for, we have seen for each edge of this type, each small f of this type, we have another edge that goes to across the cut. So the size of E star is at most x minus the size of f minus f star. So we do the algebra, this is a, the same as x minus size of f plus size of f star. And by our assumption on the cut, this now is smaller than f star. So what we see is this yellow set here is smaller than the green set. Now we can go back to the original graph and we look at a third cut. Third cut is the red one. It's the upper left part together with the lower right part together on one side of the cut. And it's the lower left and the upper right on the other side of the cut. How big is this cut? So compared to the original cut ST, we lose each, um, we lose each yellow edge because they are now all yellow edges are now on the same side, side of the cut. But on the other hand, at least each green edge comes now to our new cut because they are crossing the red cut. So we started with a maximum cut. We got rid of some edges, but we put some other edges in the cut and we put more edges into the cut than we put away before. And this tells us that our new cut Red, our new red cut would be a bigger cut than ST. But ST was already a maximum cut, so we have a contradiction. And if I have a contradiction now, I see that the flow must exist because this was our assumption. We assumed that the flow does not exist. And from there, we constructed a cut that is bigger than the maximum cut. So let's summarize what happened in the case four. We started with a maximum cut. We started with edge weights two or three. The weighted degrees are even on one side and on the other side. Then we defined designated colors that are a proper vertex coloring. And that they should be not too far away from the current weighted degrees. And then we constructed the flow problem to find the flow and to see how we can modify the edge weights so that the weight decrease and the designated colors are the same. Okay, so now we are ready to go to the next step. So we want to get rid of edge weight four. Here we start with weight two on all edges. And now the additional tool that we need is an independent set. So I call them red nodes. It's an independent set that we take <clears throat> and we choose it in a way so that the graph between R and the other nodes is connected. So we have this independent set of red nodes. The other nodes, I call them blue nodes. And we want to choose the independent set in a way so that the bipartite graph here is connected. And now we want that the nodes inside R, the red nodes have an even weighted degree. 
Then, of course, there are no coloring conflicts here. And at the blue nodes, we now apply <coughs> the idea from before. So we choose a maximum cut, ST. Of course, all nodes here should have an odd valued weighted degree. But we need an additional difference between S and T. And we do this by saying nodes in S should have a weighted degree that is one modulo four. And the weighted degrees in T should have a value that is three modulo four. So then again, coloring conflicts appear only in S and only in T once we have established this setting. So now, again, our task is to define designated colors. So again, we take an ordering of the nodes. Again, we look at the current weighted degree, and we look at the number of earlier neighbors on the same side of the cut. The difference is that now we have to take a color that is odd. Before we had even colors, now we have to choose odd colors. So where do we take dot colors from? The smallest in the interval is ci minus 2di minus 1. The biggest is ci plus 2di plus 1. So the size of this set is, again, 2di plus 2. So my color should have a correct value modulo 4. This is already given from the slide before meaning that half of the potential colors fall away. So then we are left with di plus one potential choices. There are at most di choices that are blocked from my earlier neighbors. Hence, there is at least one color from the set that remains. So we have at least one color that is possible to choose so that the color is different from all earlier neighbors and which has the correct parity modulo for at the same time. So once we have this color, our task is again to change the weighted degrees. In contrast to the setting before, the change should be odd and it should be at most 2di plus 1. Um, <clears throat> so we cannot apply our flow setting for these changes because the flow setting gives us changes that are even. But what we can do is we can pick an intermediate color. So we pick an intermediate color that is one away from the final color but which is also at most 2di away from my current color. And then for this intermediate color, we are exactly in the setting from before. So once we are in the setting, we can apply the flow strategy that we have seen before. This flow tells us how we should adjust the edge weights by plus one or minus one, because we started with edge weights two everywhere. We are still allowed to do these changes. And then each blue node has an even weighted degree that coincides with G of VI. So this intermediate color is one away from the final color. So there's a final correction of plus one or minus one required on each blue node. So I need to find a place for these final corrections. And actually, where we can do this is we can do these corrections on the edges between R and B. Because so far, we didn't do anything on these edges. So we are somehow at this situation. We have the red nodes. We have the blue nodes. On each blue node, we have either plus one or minus one, indicating what is the final correction that is needed. So then we take a spanning tree between R and P. 
Um, all other edges that are not in the spanning tree, they will just keep edge weight too. We do not do anything in, with them. And then first on these edges, we define which edges should keep at edge weight two and which edges should receive an odd weight. How are we doing this? Um, we do it in a way so we do it in a way so that for each blue node, the number of odd incident edges is odd, and for each red node, the number of odd incident edges is even. We see it here. This node has one neighboring O edge, this node as well. This node here has three neighboring O edges. But on the other hand, each red node has an even number of neighboring odd edges. And then we can decide for each odd edge whether we put edge weight one or three. How are we doing this? We look at the changes that are intended here and we distribute the weights in a way so that it becomes possible that the blue nodes receive the correction that is intended. So of course, maybe for some red nodes, we change the weighted degree. This node here, before it had two, two, two. Now it has three, three, two. So we changed the weighted degree by two. But because this is an independent set, we are fine with this. So the weighted decrease in R remain even. And the weighted decrease on blue, on the blue side, for each node, we got the change that we intended. So it seems that we are done. <clears throat> but if you're careful, then maybe realize there's a problem in this approach. So again, somehow we have the assumption that the number of blue nodes should be even. Otherwise, this will not work out. And actually, this is quite an issue. So our approach requires that we have an even number of blue nodes. And we have to find out a way how we can tackle this issue. And unfortunately, we have to do a case distinction that is yeah, not as short as we would hope. So there, are quite, there is quite a number of cases that we have to go through. I do not want to show you all cases, but I want to show you a bit how, how we can handle them and how the flavor is. So first, let's assume that the graph has a leaf. This is somehow an easy case. If you have a leaf, we define the red and the blue nodes on everything except our leaf. We do it in a way so that the neighbor of our leaf remains in R. So it, the neighbor should be a red node. And then there are two cases. Either we have an odd number of blue nodes, then I can put my leaf into the blue nodes as well, and we are done. If I have already an even number of blue nodes before looking at the leaf, <clears throat> then we have to keep the leaf even. So then the even nodes are not, no longer an independent set. We put weight two on this edge here, but now we are done in this case, because by our assumption that the graph has at least three nodes, we know this red node has at least one other neighbor. So the weighted degree of this node will be at least three, whereas the weighted degree here is two. So still we have a vertex coloring. So this is how we can solve the situation if we have at least one leaf in the graph. If the graph has no leaf, it's a bit more complicated. Then we have to remove two adjacent vertices X and Y. And we do this in a way so that the remainder is still connected. 
we define the sets R and B again on the remaining graph. And then we try to extend R and B to X or to Y or to both, at least so that the graph between R and B remains connected and that the set B has an even number of nodes. <clears throat> so maybe this is possible, but maybe one of the two nodes X or Y remains. And if it remains, it will play the role of an extra node V0 that cannot be handled somehow. That is not in B and not in R. <clears throat> and what we do in the case distinction is that we try to arrange things so that we always end up in the same kind of situations. So we try to end up in one of, I call it now, escape situations for the extra node. How do these end situations look like? One situation is where the extra node has an even number of neighbors inside R. Then what we do is we want to put odd edge weights onto the edges between the extra node and R. So here I want to put one or three. So when putting edge weights between R and B, we have to be careful that with these additional odd weights, the nodes in R become even valued. But once we are here, we can play around with these edge weights. So by putting here one or three, we modify the edge weight here, but we also modify the edge weights here. And then because we have always a choice on each edge, we have enough degrees of freedom so that it becomes possible that this weighted degree is different from all its neighbors. For example, you can put one everywhere and look, is this possible? If you have a conflict, you can put three everywhere, look, is it possible or do we still have a conflict? And otherwise you start with one everywhere and you increase edge by edge to three until you have somehow a gap where the extra node fits in. The second case is somehow the same, but we have an odd number of neighbors inside R. Here, what we need is yet one additional neighbor that is in B. Because we need to put an odd weight here so that we can put one or three here and the weighted degree here becomes even. If I would not have this edge here, I would need a two somewhere, somewhere here. And if I have a two, then I do not have enough degrees of freedom for solving all conflicts here. Then there's a third situation. This is the most complicated. Um, it's a situation where the extra node has only one neighbor in R. Maybe we have a conflict here and then we cannot solve the conflict directly on this edge. But if we have a cycle from the extra node that goes to B, then alternates between R and B and goes back to the extra node and actually, which does not use this node here as internal node, then we can change edge weights on this cycle. So we can play around here and one of the two choices will solve our conflict between this node and this node. Of course, um, during the whole proof, we need to be aware of this potential situation. So we need to arrange edge weights here and uh, we need, so that this change still is possible, we need to be careful that this potential cycle does not use this node as internal node. So it becomes kind of tricky. But it turns out that actually, we can always end up in a situation where we can extend the edge weighting to the full graph without introducing new conflicts. 
Yeah, so somehow I would say that the proof has two parts. It has the part with the independent set R, which is one idea, and the other thing is a full case distinction. All right, so I have two slides remaining. One slide, I think it's worth to look at examples because, I mean, this is a problem which is interesting even on small graphs. And this is the way I got into the problem by playing around the small examples. Look as a puzzle, how can I find the edge rating? And now we can see what happens with our strategy. So on this graph here, we have only two blue nodes. We have an independent set of size three. And here we have an extra node that was remaining. We see designated colors on the blue nodes, three and five. The edges here are so that these colors are reached. And here on the green nodes, um, we had to find out how we put the edge weights. If I will put one and one, I would get rated degree two, two here. I would have a conflict with this neighbor. So then I increased the edge weight to my highest neighbor, to three. The highest neighbor was this one here. Now I have six here, two here, and four fits perfectly in between. The second example that I want to show you is K5. Here we have only one red node. We have four blue nodes. We have the maximum cut ST. We have designated colors here, 9, 5, 7, 11. And we have somehow intermediate colors here, 6, 8, 8, 10. Then we apply here the flow strategy. This tells us you need to change the edge weight on the orange and on the green edges to actually reach these intermediate colors. And then some remaining changes can be done with the edges between R and B. For example, this node here has plus one. We need to increase the rating by one to, for going from 10 to 11. And we do this by increasing this edge rate from two to three. And then when we do this on each node, this node here becomes even weighted. So all other edges, these two edges, they are rated with two in this example. Okay, so the last slide is a remark about the algorithmic complexity. So the proof is somehow constructive, but at some point we need to find a maximum cut, which is NP complete. But I think that this should not be necessary. Instead of taking the maximum cut, we could start with an arbitrary cut. And then we try to find our flow. If we find the flow, we are fine. If we do not find the flow, by the argument that we have seen before, we find this red flow, uh, this red cut across. And this red cut is a bigger cut than our initial cut. So then we will continue with the red cut, apply the idea again, either we find a flow or again we find a bigger cut. So we can iterate, 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 but at some point we cannot extend the cut anymore. At this point we have not a maximum cut, but a maximal cut, and there the flow should work. And therefore, I think it should be possible to find actually the vertex coloring edge weighting in polynomial time. Which would be nice because we know for edge weights one and two, it's NP complete. So then we have the other side. If you have edge weight three possible, then it's always possible in polynomial time. So this was what I wanted to tell you. Thank you for the attention. <laughs>